about ready to go. The first speaker is going to be Alistair Coburn, and on some level, I'm not sure he needs an introduction, but he's uh, he's got to be considered one of the, the founding fathers of the Agile movement. He's had a profound personal effect on, on my approach to building software, building teams, and he appears to be missing, but <laughs> there he is, the wizard, the Agile witch doctor. He's here to... Uh, Give us some of this crazy voodoo. So, take it away. Mic check again. So this hat is the hat that I got when I organized the first Agile Conference, the Agile Development Conference in 2003, which is held here in Salt Lake City. And, uh, so I thought that I would start off with this and then pass it on to Drew. At the end of the talk, I'll pass on the, uh, the Agile Conference wizard hat to Drew at the, uh, at the end of this talk. So Drew, that's coming to you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, now, this actually, I, I give a fair number of talks and this talk has been sort of tormenting me because uh, Andrew and, and Kay and Nate were interested in a conference. Uh, they, were, they wanted to be Agile Roots and uh, Agile Fringe at the same time. So you guys know that book? It's called Eats, Shoots, and Leaves, right? Because they put the comma in the wrong place. It's supposed to be a panda bear that eats, shoots, and leaves as opposed to a crook who eats, shoots, and leaves. And so I was going to call this Roots, Shoots, and Leaves. But the, the interesting uh, dichotomy that he wanted out of this conference was they want to go back to the roots of Agile. What are the roots that we've forgotten? People get caught up in all the funny things that are happening. They go back to Agile roots, but at the same time, they wanted to, holding fast to the roots, if you will, look at the, at the fringes, the shoots and the leaves, if you will, of the whole Agile world. And so how would you put all of that together? What is shoots and you know, roots, shoots, and leaves all at the same part? So in some sense, I'm obliged to give you, you know, like, oh, the history of Agile, oh, how we got here, you know, and all of that sort of stuff. And that was, uh, that was really uh, perturbing me until I saw um, a lovely uh, keynote by, by John Cleese, in which he was in the same predicament. And so what he did was to throw away his notes and uh, say, what I really want to talk about is why I've always been crazy about guided missiles. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm actually going to read his talk because I don't normally read, but it's so good. Uh, I just edited out a few things, and you'll see why I, uh, I picked up. Uh, so why I've always been crazy about guided missiles. Throughout my childhood, guided missiles enchanted me in a way that normally only ugly ducklings or pirates or talking vermin enchant a child. In fact, the first nursery story that my mother ever read me was called Gordon the Guided Missile. Now, when Gordon sets off, it sends out signals to discover it's on course, and signals come back. No, you're not on course, so change it. So it changes, it moves up a bit, you know, to the left, and it sends out another signal, and the signal comes back and says, you're wrong again, change it. And so Gordon changes course, and then rational creature said that he is, sends out signal after signal, and the missile goes on making mistake after mistake, and so on, correcting its behavior in light of, of new information, until it blows up the nasty enemy thing. And then we applaud the missile for its skill. And then the critic comes along and says, well, it made an awful lot of mistakes along the way. And we say, well, it didn't matter, did it? I mean, it got there in the end. All of its mistakes were little ones that could be corrected. As a result of making hundreds of little mistakes that could be corrected immediately, eventually the missile succeeded in avoiding the one mistake that would have really mattered missing the target. So John Cleese goes on from Gordon the Guided Missile and says more things. He was actually talking about creativity and learning, but it applies so much I'm just going to keep going. He says, I'm not advocating we tolerate true copper bottom to mistakes like wearing a black bra or a white blouse, or to take a more masculine example, starting a land war in Asia. Now, he wrote this in the like 80s, right? So, what I'm advocating is a positive attitude toward mistakes that, at the time they were committed, did have a chance and they could teach us something. A tolerant and positive attitude toward mistakes manifests itself in two ways. First, in allowing behavior that may turn out to be a mistake. And second, in acknowledging the mistake if it's eventually shown to be such. 
There's an English proverb, the man who does not make mistakes is unlikely to make anything. Research has shown that high, high creativity stems from the ability to respond spontaneously to intuitions without immediately imposing critical thought. In other words, playfulness. Is that uh, the signal for me to put my hat back on while I continue to read about playfulness? This ties in with my own experience of what makes a group function more creatively. People must use their inhibitions, their fear of mistakes. In fact, the really good idea is often traceable a long way back, often to a not very good idea that sparked off another idea that was slightly better, which was misunderstood by somebody else, but was said in such a way that something quite interesting was picked up by somebody else who combined it with an earlier idea, which most people had forgotten, all of which reshaped by somebody else, and so on. Now back to Gordon. A positive attitude toward mistakes will allow them to be corrected rapidly. The problems come when mistakes are denied. You can't say, well, I got that right, so now I better fix it. The trick is to get rid of the ego-driven management policy that says the box stops right over there. I think there are ways to balance between the need to have a tolerant and positive attitude toward mistakes and the need to avoid unnecessary hurt to egos. Persuade yourselves and others that admitting small mistakes right away protects your ego more efficiently than running the risk of making a far more painful mistake later. Fight the tendency to identify with ideas. Our egos often become attached to ideas before we've really pondered them and decided whether we were for or against them. Think of this, if a thought enters my head, I tend to say, I think that, and then already it's my idea, something I possess, something that if anybody else criticizes, also criticizes me. I used to, back in the 90s, put a pen cap on a table when I would say, I, let's, I'll posit this, and then I'll talk to the, to the pen cap on the table. I'll posit this, let's consider that. And if it didn't work, then I would knock the pen cap over and I'd say, well, that didn't stand up very long, did it? You know, but I'd keep putting these things up. And that was a way of just taking the heat off of the ego attachment to particular ideas. Finally, create an atmosphere of tolerance and positiveness toward mistakes by serving as a model. Often say that you don't know the solution. Then throw up a couple of ideas, and if they don't turn out to be very fruitful, discard them. Better still, discuss a couple of recent mistakes that you've made and learn from them. An ego loss, any ego loss suffered is more than compensated for in my experience by the ego gain showing you're the kind of person who's big enough to admit being wrong. Because that was John Cleese, that he said that so well, and I couldn't resist starting off with Gordon the Guided Missile so much better than the history of Agile at all. So that, that's uh, the video you can find. I had to get a preview, sign up and something and get a preview, uh, a viewing of it. I couldn't download it, but the text you can find online so you can go and you can hunt down the word of the guy in this. So the next thing to do to avoid actually talking about agile development and the history of agile development for a little while longer, I want to drag in Miyamoto Musashi, the samurai of the of uh, 1675. Now I suspect that this is where uh, Stephen Covey got his inspiration for the Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, because uh, Miyamoto Musashi wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Successful Samurai. And I want to recap some of the points from uh, Miyamoto uh, with how they're a linkage to agile development. He said, the field is rife with showmanship, school becoming theatrical, showing off to make a living. Uh, that was my sensation in the 1990s when we had the, you know, the methodology wars. We had Booch and Rumbaugh and Jakobsen and all those guys, Schleyer, Miller. And if any of you remember, um, at Uppsala, they actually had contests and wars between them and they put them in different rooms and give them all assignments and they had like a half a day or a day to produce some code or something like that. So they had all these like on stage duels between the, the methodologists. Uh, and there were a lot of us who felt that, that there was just too much fanciness and showmanship um, and adherence to school dogma in uh, all of the methodologies in the 90s. And very much part of what Agile is about is getting rid of the dogma, getting rid of the of the, the, the theater and the showmanship. The punchline is ship software. That's really the punchline of the story. And he said, one can win with the short sword, one can win with the long sword, one can win with either. There's a time and a place when each is appropriate. 
And that's very nice because there are people uh, who can code in C++ or C or .NET or Smalltalk or Lisp. And the good ones, they, 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 they literally, they don't care. It's the programming language expresses their ideas. They move, they see through the programming language to their ideas, and they can, they can ship software either way. That having been said, they also recognize that uh, you know, sometimes this environment is better, or this tool is better, and they can use uh, different tools for different jobs. In the case of Musashi, he was apparently, you know, I mean, he, learned to, he lived to be 60, he was a samurai, he still had all arms and legs intact, so obviously he was a big, fast guy. And apparently he sort of would go into battle, you know, bonk someone on the head, and take their weapon away, and fight with their weapon for a while, and after he beat somebody, he'd throw away his weapon, and take their weapon. So, on. so he could win with anything, but he said, you know, I'm not an idiot. If you're out in the field, you prefer a long spear, and if in your stairwell, you prefer a short sword, like that. So that was uh, him about tools. Then he said, one of my favorite things that he said, if your sword misses, leave it there until the opponent strikes again, whereupon strike from below. So you can imagine the other schools of thought saying, very rigorously, you, you, know, you have to start from the upper right and go down to the lower left. And if you miss, well, you know, you have to get back to the upper right again, because that's the way our school fights. And he says, while you're doing that, you'll be run through with a sword. So I call this the no wasted movement principle from, from Musashi. No wasted movement. Everything that you do has got to add value. Now, those of you who are looking at the lean stuff that's coming in these, these days, they talk a lot about Buddha or waste and lean. By the way, I give these talks in Japan, and they're really amazed that Americans are talking about Musashi and Kaizen and Buddha, right, Kanban, and all this kind of stuff that we're bringing back to the Japanese software industry. So there's the no-wasted movement. And so those in the 90s, those of us who were looking at software development in the 90s, kept seeing lots of wasted movements, so theater, wasted movement, adherence to certain particular favorite tools, and so on. Then he said another thing that's very, very wonderful is where you hold your sword depends on your relationship to the opponent must conform to the situation. Uh, he's got a wonderful, he teaches five positions, and the fifth position he calls a position without a position. He says, you know, it doesn't matter what I write in this book about how to fight. When you're in an actual fight, you know, there's a tree stump in the way, you're on a hill, something's just not right. Uh, you have to be able to operate from any position whatsoever. So again, going back to the 90s, this is part of the roots. What I'm trying to do is to lead you to a place. In the 90s, we saw something. We understood something. We codified it, but we tried to codify it, the Agile Manifesto. People who come after only see the manifesto. What I'm trying to do is give it a little bit of an image of what was there before that helped generate it. All right. So back in the 90s, uh, when I used to teach people how to use CRC cards, there was a big, there was a big uh, orthodoxy about what size cards you had to use. You know, you had to use there was wars between the four by six cards and the three by five cards. People got them all printed up specially with particular places where you had to put the different notes on the card, what you put on the front of the card, what you put on the back of the card. Orthodoxy sets in in about three minutes is what I've what I've come to understand about this. Um, so what I found was, if we're sitting at a table and we want to do a little bit of design, it already breaks the discussion if someone says, I'm going to get the cards. And then they walk away for 90 seconds. We've already lost the conversation. So what I would do is just take ordinary pieces of paper and tear them into quarters, and you can just draw on that. So that's position without a position. Don't worry about what cards you've got or whether you've got cards. Always move from here now and be morphing what you're doing to fit this, the needs of the moment. Hold it so it'll be easy to kill the opponent. Think of any guard as part of the act of killing. Now, here's an interesting thing. Here's Musashi in 1675. Looking ahead 300 years, 350 years at computer programming, and already understanding the tension between developers, you know, out to kill each other. I actually was doing this, and I said to a group of people, 150 people, and I said, so, so what is the opponent that he keeps referring to? Someone says, the user. <laughs> And like three or four people will go on on this, and I go, time out. I'm willing to roll with the, with the punches here. But no, the answer is not. This guy, he says, sometimes you just have to take out the other person so you can get your work done. I go, no, no, stop. <laughs> Don't go there. OK, so there's enough opponents just in the real world, you know, all, of, all the things on your project that are going wrong. 
But anyway, here's again, no wasted movement, always be moving forward. Observe reflectively. Now you'll find a lot of attention in the Agile world about introspection, reflection, retrospectives, those kinds of things. And here's Musashi already talking about this. Observe reflectively with overall awareness of the large picture as well as precise attention to small details. And this is, if you're doing architecture planning, it's what I call coarse grain long-term view, fine grain short-term view. And a lot of people coming to Agile forget about the coarse grain long-term view and very much in the culture, probably a goof as far as I'm concerned, this overemphasis on tactical behavior, tactical planning, tactical design, and we forget about the value of, of the long-term view. Large pictures as well as small details. Finally, he says something that I particularly identify with. Each school's views are realized differently according to the mentality of the person. So whether you're doing XP, Scrum, Crystal, FDD, or your made up thing and a new person comes in, everybody's going to interpret it differently we have to find ways to get all these different inter interpretations to function. In my school, consideration is given to anything, however unreasonable, the heart of the matter is to gain victory or ship software in our case. So there's Musashi, I mean, he did an amazing job of summarizing our field by writing about the uh, uh, same year I life back in the, in the 1600s. So if we fast forward, and now at this point, I need to, to pause and give you that little bit of history. Um, there were 17 of us who met at um, Snowbird in 2001. And the reason it was Snowbird was because uh, Bob Martin said, um, I want to get some people together and talk about these lightweight processes that we've been studying up in the 90s. Um, and he proposed to get, and he says, and I want to write a manifesto, which I thought was pretty weird of him, but it turns out he was right and I was wrong, so there you go. Uh, and he wanted to hold it in Chicago in February. Any of you know what Chicago in February is like? And Jim Highsmith was living here, and so the two of us like both sat on one end of the seesaw together and said, how about Snowbird instead? Um, and reason prevailed, just barely. And uh, so we got to held a Snowbird. But out of the 17 people, uh, everybody had their own private history in the 90s. They got thinking along a sort of a parallel line. Mine was that I was hired by IBM in 1991. Uh, I'd been in IBM research in Switzerland and wanted to come back to the US and the IBM consulting group was just starting up. And they said, we need a process and methodology for our consultants to use uh, around the world when they've got small talk or C++ or Objective-C or generally object-oriented projects. We don't know what the answer is. All we care is that it works. We're going to roll it out worldwide. And I said, I don't know what anything about methodology. And my boss gave said, well, why don't you go interview some project teams? Just do some debriefings and find out what works. And gave me unlimited airplane uh, tickets to anywhere in the world. And I spent about three years uh, flying around interviewing projects. And I found a very, very sharp difference, those that were delivering and those that weren't. So almost perfect correlation that popped up instantly. Those that were following the process they were supposed to were not shipping software. Those that were doing things that we would now call agile, but honestly, nobody had any words for it, and they would often apologize for it. They focused on talking to each other, talking to the customers and users, the sponsors, shipping software every, every couple of months, and getting feedback. And that's all they did. And so my first methodology in 92 contained basically incremental development, use cases, CRC cards, and code. And that was it. That was the, that was the whole thing. Uh, but we didn't have good ways to talk about it. So that's, that's my personal history. And as I developed that through the 90s, then I came to this conference. Now, is Brian Merrick here? Brian, where are you? Could you stand up, please? Be so kind. Now, Brian Merrick, you're very lucky at this conference. Brian Merrick was also there, and he has his own history through the 90s. So I encourage you to find Brian sometime in the next two days and find, hear from him what his personal history was in the 90s, that, you know, what was he looking for, and what did he, what was he worried about, and what was he, he, he anxious about, and that he wanted to get in the manifesto. So there were 17 of us with this. And the amazing thing was basically in about, in about six hours we wrote this manifesto. It was all done pretty much on the first day. By by the end of the first day, we had it. It was it was for me the best meeting, self-organized, self-facilitated meeting I have ever ever been in. And we came up with we said, you know, we think that we are really operating off of a different value set than other people. What would make our value set uh, interesting and different? What are we if we take everything that you could work from 
and you cherry picked just a couple, what would you get as the core items? So I'm only bringing out now the positive side of the manifesto on the, other, the right hand side. Focus on individuals and their interactions. This is about people trading ideas. The individual people, we, and the, and the particular way they interact with each other. We should really be studying psychology and sociology because that is the business we're in uh, from the sort of management, the social management side of it. We said documents don't break. Bubbles don't break, they used to say in the 90s. The only thing that gives you honest feedback is, is software. So focus on working software, use it for feedback, deliver it, and everything like that. Second, third thing, collaborate with your customers. Now the word customers comes from the XP language. Who knows if that means the buyer, the sponsor, the user, whatever, any, any combination of those. And finally, the one that gets uh, most misrepresented, I like to phrase it this way these days, attend to current reality, respond to changing circumstances. In, in the manifesto it says, responding to change over following the plan. And people interpret that to mean don't plan. On the contrary, plan very often. Have good, lightweight ways to plan. The world's gonna change out from underneath you so fast, you better have, have really good ways of re-planning. Uh, if your lead developer quits, you, know, you can't say go back to the plan. You need a new lead developer. So attend the current reality. So that was the 2001 manifesto. And people look at these and they try, they focus on these words and then project in their own mind whatever weirdnesses they want to project to. Um, but if we go back to the 90s, we were seeing Project Ship because they focused on, sharp focused on people, sharp focused on having work, working software, and a sharp focus on getting feedback. So those being three critical. So now, for those of you who are coming in new, I'm looking at the faces, a lot of you really know a lot about Agile, so this should be stock stuff to you. Um, but there may be people who are coming in uh, new, and so I want to kind of give you that view of the 90s and then going forward. Well, what happened next, in 2003 at the conference, there were a group of people who said, you know, that's all very nice, but that's very programmer focused somehow. What would that mean from a larger perspective, from the, from the perspective of, let's say, product management, project management, line management, upper management, any kind of, if you're looking at the product in a holistic sense, or the organization in a holistic sense, and not just looking at a piece of software, as Pollyanna here, Pollyanna, could you stand up, please? So now, Pollyanna, this is how lucky you are being here. Pollyanna was there right from 2003, also helping to write the addendum or the, the next stage of the Agile Manifesto, which not enough people know about, which we came to call the Declaration of Interdependence, uh, which got finalized in 2005. And so I encourage you to, uh, to talk to Pollyanna about what she was bringing in. In that time, 2001 to 2005, people living with the Manifesto saying it's nice, but it's missing something. And so we wrote this addendum. Now, I get to make fun of everybody. Those of you know me, I make fun of everybody. Uh, so I like to make fun of the fact that we had a bunch of project managers writing the Declaration of Interdependence. We had programmers writing the Agile Manifesto. So the Agile Manifesto was written in six hours. It took three years to write the Declaration of Interdependence <laughs> for the project managers. And I got pretty frustrated because we'd have all these schedules for the day about, about how we were going to self-organize and uh, self-manage ourselves. And I kept saying, can we just like be left alone so we could like self-organize and do something? Well, no, that's a 13-step process that we're going to walk through about creating a vision and purpose and mission. So anyway, we got it done, and it's great, great, great stuff. It doesn't get as much attention. So if you go to the, the website, you hunt up this thing, you'll find it. And I'll just give you the capsule summary of the six things now. General line management, project management, product management, product development, however you like it. And we wanted to bring in some new things. So focus on producing a continuous flow of value. In traditional project management, they focus on tasks, and we were saying, no, it's not the task, it's like the working software, but whatever it is that the value point is, produce value and focus, track the value production, not the task completion. Also, borrowing from Lean, and, and you may be lucky to hear a fair amount about Lean, um, that Lean has come in and joined Agile Development in a nice way. Uh, you borrow the idea of continuous flow. Don't do these big batch transfers from requirements to design, but try to get a whole continuous flow all the way from requirements out to the customer. Secondly, back to customers again, engage customers, frequent interaction, and if you possibly can, shared ownership. 
then we felt there was too much tactical work, so we said, you know, you're actually allowed to think. You are really allowed to think. So we said, anticipate, adapt, iterate. You need these three. You're never going to get rid of uncertainty, but the way you handle it is you anticipate, adapt, and iterate. Then we fell back to the individuals, but there was a sharper language on this. Create an environment where individuals feel they can make a difference. There's a, there's a large contrast in organizations, whether this is true or false. This is not motherhood and apple pie. It's hard to do, and it matters. Foster group accountability and shared responsibility. So those of you who've been in, in my classes at least, um, and possibly other ones, you'll know, talk a lot about group accountability for results. It doesn't matter if a programmer says, hey, I can't start programming. I haven't got enough requirements yet. Go help the requirements person, right? It's like a, a cartoon I saw. I wish I had a cartoon now of a rowboat. And there's two people in it. There's a leak. And the one said to the other, no, I'm leaks if you're into the rowboat, man. Fail. And the last one, uh, we're back to, uh, is, is the idea of applying situationally specific strategies and process. There is no closed form formula. Uh, life's always changing out from under you. I know you read some good books, but look, we're in a professional field. If this was easy, there would be no competitive edge you would have been solved a long time ago. The ground is always changing out from under us. Uh, whatever you've learned, it'll apply no doubt sometime. This is back to Musashi, position without a position. You learn lots of things, but you're actually living in position without a position. So there's the Agile Manifesto, and one of the things that happened since then uh, that people uh, tend not to know enough about is the Declaration of Interdependence. It's very, very powerful. You can hang the Declaration of Interdependence up on your office wall. And probably if you look at it every week, you'll find something that you're violating and you can use it as a touchstone on ways of operating. Now then, going from the roots, right, of the pre-2001 period, uh, lean uh, manufacturing goes back to the 50s. Toyota's been working on it for a long time. Its real name is Toyota Production System. You'll find that a lot of people in the agile world, particularly since about 2000, have been going back and re-reading how does Toyota produce cars? What's the way they do this? There are an awful lot of similarities, just a remarkable number of similarities. And what I conclude is I've got nothing to teach Toyota. Toyota still has stuff to teach us. And they just keep improving over and over and over again. So this is a one-shot improvement. You can start on this and keep going for the next 50 years. So you'll find that since 2001, uh, Kent Beck was the first person who mentioned Lean to Me, then Mary Poppendick, David Anderson, and more and more people have come in, written books, there's now Lean Agile conferences. What's fascinating to me is you get almost the same answers, almost identical answers, from a totally different field, car manufacture. People say, there can't be anything in common between, between software design, where every problem is different, and car manufacture, where you put the same parts on the same kind of cars, you know, time after time. Well, it turns out if you make this one shift that's marked on the slide, and, the, and instead of car parts, instead of bumpers or steering wheels coming down the line, being, being classified as inventory, in, internal inventory that you should run to zero. If you take a look at any team design activity, You'll see people waiting on each other for decisions. And the unvalidated decision is what it is in team design is our unit of inventory. And you can probably, in your mind, make a quick sketch that looks a bit like this of your organization and who's waiting on who for what kinds of decisions. And you can probably, in a heartbeat, name the place, the person with the inbox stacked up high with decisions waiting to be closed out. And the whole company is, in fact, waiting on this person or these people to get through their inbox. That is, in manufacturing terms, called bottleneck station. There's a lot of literature about bottleneck stations. You can go look at Elihu Goldratt's theory of constraints, the theory of constraints. There's a whole field of inquired study and, and results that's available to us in software development, as well as lead manufacturing during the production system. So if we drop in this notion of inventory, our inventory is the unvalidated decision, we can, guess what? Start to apply just-in-time manufacturing ideas, continuous flow, can ban, all of these things just drop straight into our lab. As far as I can tell, the mathematics is exactly, we've got decades of, of mathematics that we can make use of. So there's a lot here to be mined. Those of you who are looking forward, um, there are people who like to know, like, what's the next thing? What should I be reading up on? 
lead manufacturing, lead software development, lead design. But I always go straight back to Toyota. They've been hammering on this for, for, for half a century and have a lot, a lot of results. Uh, what happens is you get pictures like this that I like very much because if you make these little, these little pictures and you get the uh, um, different, I, uh, the different uh, flows, you'll notice the bottlenecks are in different places and I've got three set up there. Uh, you maybe have lots of programmers but not enough database designers, not enough UI designers. The way you behave on those projects is fundamentally different than if you've got not enough programmers and too many of the other things. Or if your sponsors are absent, they're the people who are supposed to be giving you priorities and business feedback, and they're not there. So the strategies that you can apply are different processes. So you'll use different processes. Again, coming through the lean doorway. And finally, I want to just remind everybody that what we're talking about here would be considered team design. Team design consists of nothing but moving ideas between minds. Now you're subject to talent, you're subject to tools, in fact. But when you get a team of people working, somebody knows something that somebody else needs. And you're trying to minimize the time between discovery and, and transmission of, of that idea. How long does it take to get a question answered? Is your basic question. And one of the things that's fascinating is you can now make the list. Anything, anything that slows the movement of ideas between minds slows the project. So if you want to speed up the project, find things that are slowing the movement of ideas between minds, remove it, and you'll see some speed up. That includes things like the obvious one, physical distance, time distances, cultural differences. But now we get into back into attitude, trust, morale, personal safety, amicability, all of those kinds of things that make an influence of, of whether somebody actually even bothers to listen to somebody else and talk to somebody else. So if you focus on that one idea, you'll probably find lots of ways to improve your, your environment. So the punchline of this, my, the theme for, for the, the conference, my hope for the conference, is simply tear down barriers of all kinds between minds. And we're all in this, in this robot together. There's, in fact, only us. So with that, uh, I suggest you just have fun. that stuff in classes. 
Um, so like uh, the, the dogma, the schools have shown up. XP. We say individuals and interactions over processes and tools, but we argue processes like maniac. Okay? Scrum's better than XP. <laughs> right? And you get all this, well I do, well I do Fibonacci. I play Fibonacci card planning poker. Oh, we use binary. Oh, you can't use binary, don't you know Fibonacci is much better, right? And you get all of these these little little mini schools forming and having these fights and I, and I go to classes. Um, and so there's a lot of dogma that grows up right in here. It's, that first thing of Musashi comes back around in the Agile world. Um, so those are the only two things um, that I can particularly think of. I'll take one more question. Yes, please, way back there. On Lean and Kanban? Yeah, he says, uh, uh, what can we learn from Lean and Kanban on the strategic as opposed to tactical? The Lean Kanban stuff that you're seeing, if I heard you correctly, uh, seems very tactical, and I, and I agree with you there. I do want to say one thing about Kanban. I'm not going to answer the question, because the short answer is I don't know. I mean, I don't know. So you got it. Uh, but Kanban, for me, is fascinating. Those of you who haven't looked at it, take a peek at this thing. Um, what I love about it is it turns agile development on its ear. So somebody, Arlo Belshi, started the whole thing as far as I'm concerned with a talk he gave called Naked Planning. And he said, you know, I don't like iterations. I, and I don't like estimating. And I don't like all that that, that we do that surrounds all the, the ceremony and dancing we do around uh, iteration boundaries. How about we just make a work area and we'll move a card in when we start and we'll move a card out when it's done and we can, we can time stamp it. And we can build a queue of all of the things that are coming up. You can do like in Disneyland and say, you know, three months to delivery from here, and you know, two months to delivery from here, you know, Disneyland, one hour to the ride from here, and all that kind of stuff. And then, oh, look how much time and energy we'll save. Well, what I love about this, like he throws out the heart of, of what we had become the thing in the 90s of, of good ways of developing. So he throws out time boxes, right, iteration, sprint planning meetings, uh, estimates. There are no estimates, you just put in the item and out and figure out how long it took. Gets rid of estimating, gets rid of a whole bunch of stuff. And this then has been um, uh, converted by other people, built on by other people um, in the Kanban world, and, and they, they do all of this, so there's no estimating. Uh, Kanban is very, very interesting. Take a look at it, and it gets rid of iterations and the estimates, and it's and burn up charts and burn down charts, and all of those things that we now consider a dogma inside the Agile world. So I love it because it's, it's very interesting. But has nothing to do with strategic, uh, so leaves that that hole there. All right, I'm now out of time. I'm going to turn over the podium to the next speaker. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alistair. Let's have another round of applause for Alistair. That was awesome.